Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Stress-Free ND podcast. I am really, really excited and honored today to bring you my friend, Dr. Amy Commander, who will be sharing with us her insight with respect to stress and cancer. Welcome, Dr. Commander. Thank you so much for this wonderful invitation. <laughs> and your beautiful yes. smile. Okay, so Dr. Commander is board certified in hematology and medical oncology and lifestyle medicine. She is a breast oncologist at the Massachusetts General Hospital Cancer Center, director of breast oncology and cancer survivorship at the Mass General Cancer Center in Waltham and at Newton Wellesley Hospital. She is co-medical director of the Mass General Cancer Center in Waltham as well, and instructor in medicine at Harvard Medical School. Wow, we are so honored to have you here. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. So let's get to it, right? So, you know, as a radiologist who spent a lot of time in women's imaging as a you know, self-care professional that works a lot with individuals on the cancer journey and with you in this very, very specialized space of breast cancer and with a focus on survivorship and all the things you do, let's talk about stress as it relates to cancer and the kinds of things that come up for you and your patients and what you can educate us on today. Thank you, Robin, for inviting me to join you. It's really an honor to be a guest on your podcast, which I've been thoroughly enjoying on my own, I must add. So oh, thank you. Um, Obviously, we're recording this in October, which is Breast Cancer Awareness Month. And I think we would both acknowledge that every month should be Breast Cancer Awareness Month. And certainly, this is certainly the most common cancer diagnosed in women after skin cancer. So certainly, all women need to be aware of the importance of breast cancer screening. Um, but your question was really related to stress and how stress may be related to perhaps development of cancer. And I think what I really would like to emphasize that certainly stress can cause many physical health problems as you discussed on prior episodes and you're helping all of us deal with this. Um, the evidence relating stress to causing cancer really is weak. And I think, you know, there are so many ways that stress could potentially lead to cancer. And that's really because stress can lead to so many harmful behaviors, such as smoking, overeating, drinking alcohol, and all of those factors certainly can increase a person's risk for cancer, breast cancer and other cancers. Um, but the actual, you know, the stress from our job or stress for itself, while well, certainly perhaps it's at some, you know, level within our bodies causing effects in our immune system, or other pathways perhaps could lead to cancer. I think that exact mechanism is still being researched and we need to understand it better. Yeah, so I get that question a lot. Like, oh, did the stress cause my cancer? And so we don't have research showing, as you mentioned, that stress causes cancer. Although there is research out there that shows that stress is related to cancer growth and progression once you have cancer, but not that it's causing cancer. But as you mentioned, it is directly related to all of these other behaviors that we know are causing cancer, are related to cancer, like eating the wrong foods, being overweight, smoking, you know, all of these things. And so we also understand that stress affects our immune systems and we need our immune systems to be strong as our internal army that getting rid of all of these cancer cells that are forming every day in our bodies, right? So we have these cells every day and our immune system says, oh no, not today, and <laughs> gets rid of these cells, right? So we need our immune system to be strong, which the stress response and having too much stress does decrease the ability of that immune system. So it is a tricky language, right? When, when we have to deal with that causal word, but there are lots of things that we can do to, you know, to try and decrease the other things that stress causes that may lead to cancer. I think that's a really important point because as a breast oncologist, um, you know, I primarily are caring for women with breast cancer at every stage. And many of our patients, of course, experience stress for many reasons. 
you know, certainly due to their diagnosis and, you know, all the factors associated with that and the treatment, anxiety about uncertainties in terms of what's going to happen over the course of their disease. And, you know, there's so many factors that contribute to the stress that our patients experience. And we really need practitioners like you, given your passion for helping people manage stress to help our patients with coping skills to handle, you know, the distress of essentially that occurs after a cancer diagnosis. Yeah, well, thank you for that. And yeah, I, in, you know, diagnosing so much cancer, um, you know, I would get so many gifts from patients, you know, save my life, all these things, but yet I would go home and I would just feel horrible saying, well, how can I help that individual? Because now I know that their life's going to be very different, right? They're sitting on the couch. They're worried about their pre-operative tests. They're, they're worried about what's going to happen with their chemo and radiation. They're worried about the next time they come in to see me. There's all this worry. There's all this no sleeping, not eating right, all this stuff. And, you know, being able to help in a different way has been really, really wonderful to teach individuals how to help themselves while they're going through this journey. So take me, take me into your office, right? Take me into your, your office. You're a very compassionate, caring physician. I know that's super important to you. We need more doctors like you. Um, your patient, you're meeting your patient for the first time and you're noticing as expected that there's stress and anxiety on board and you're talking to them about what's to come. You know, you're, you're telling them what you recommend. Um, what do you share in terms of helping them alleviate, you know, their stresses, their anxieties, their inability to sleep and all that stuff that's coming up? That's a great question. And it's interesting that you asked that, of course, because it's funny, when I was in college, my passion was neuroscience and psychology. And I somehow always thought I'd end up going into psychiatry. So in medical school, that was an area I did significant research in and sort of thought that was the path I would go down. But in the end, I ended up falling in love with internal medicine and I wanted to care for the whole patient. And, but it's interesting as an oncologist, which obviously I became, those skills and the areas I studied in psychiatry play such an important role. Because as you clearly stated, a cancer diagnosis, it goes without saying, is life-changing and affects a, a woman, you know, since I'm a breast oncologist, in so many ways, not just the patient herself, but thinking about you know, her family, her children, you know, all the individuals that, you know, are part of her support network and how can we support this patient and her family um, coping with the treatment, but also the psychosocial aspect. So I'm really fortunate where I work at the Mass General Cancer Center to have wonderful programs in place that really help support um, the mental well-being of our patients in addition to all the cancer-directed therapy, which is so important. And just to give one example of that, since I know it's an interest of yours, um, I have colleagues at the Benson Henry Institute for Mind-Body Medicine here in Boston, and there's this eight-week stress management and resiliency program, which teaches a lot of the skills that I know you're passionate about, you know, managing you know, mind-body interventions, the goal of meditation, strategies to promote resilience. And this program is available to all of our patients and has really helped so many. And I'm so grateful to have that option here. It's amazing. Every hospital, every medical center, every clinic <laughs> should be able to offer something like this to their patients. And I know that that's few and far between. So that could be an incredible prototype for other institutions to follow. I know. Yeah. I'm very fortunate to have that option here. I also want to share with you, it's funny, in my office, I was showing you one of the books on my shelf. <laughs> such, you know, an avid yogi. And that's also a passion of yours. And Robin, I'm just going to share on your own podcast that <laughs> a forward to this book, Yoga for Cancer, a guide to managing side effects, boosting immunity, and improving recovery for cancer survivors by Terry Princeter. And it's funny, I've had this book, and I've shared it with so many patients, and I never realized that you wrote the forward. So that is amazing. Why don't you tell us more about that? Yeah. <laughs> so right before we started the podcast, Archer Commander 
held up this book. She wanted to show me this book. And I was like, yeah, you know that book. I, I reviewed it. I, I wrote the forward and I'm very, very fond of it. And it's a book that I actually give out to all of my private clients on the cancer journey. It was written by Tari Princer, who was one of my teachers, who herself is a breast cancer thriver. And she has trainings where she teaches other yoga professionals um, how to work with individuals on the cancer journey through yoga in a very safe and effective way. And she and I have worked together and presented together for years. Actually, I just had an email from her today. She's asked me to be one of the medical um, experts in a oncology yoga um, I guess platform that she's creating. But this book for anyone out there that's either a healthcare professional or an individual on the cancer journey was written for the patient. Right? Of course, we love doctors reading this, but Tari wrote it so that patients can have a home practice. So the first part of the book goes through some basic explanations of what happens in different systems in your body when you have cancer. And then the second half of the book has very simple diagrams so that you can safely have a yoga practice at home because she noticed that people couldn't get to class everywhere. There weren't classes available everywhere or sometimes Physicians such as yourself may say to your patient, your white count's too low. It's not safe for you to go out. And then what happens? And this is before Zoom <laughs> became really big. So um, she wrote this book so that individuals didn't have to miss their practice. So I'm really proud to be part of that book. I'm so excited that you have it in your office. <laughs> and it's really a wonderful yeah. resource and it's very, very affordable too. And I don't get anything for this book. <laughs> I'm just sharing it because I really am very fond of it and it's helped so many of my clients. Yeah, yeah cool. thank you for sharing that. I've shared it with many patients. So I'm so happy to hear about your relationship with this author too and your involvement because it's amazing. And yoga is such a great tool, as I know you agree, for obviously for physical activity, for also, but also for helping manage stress um, in the setting, you know, certainly for our patients with a cancer diagnosis. So I'm really grateful to have this book as a resource. Thank you. Thanks for sharing that. <laughs> it's awesome. So, you know what I think would be really great is if you can talk to us about lifestyle medicine, because I know that wasn't always a part of your practice. It wasn't, it was something that you have become more involved in and more recently certified in. And the pillars of lifestyle medicine really touch on what you talked about earlier with respect to what we know with behaviors that are associated with cancer and lifestyle medicine principles can help direct individuals away from those behaviors. So I feel like that's probably something that you're weaving into your education with respect to your patients now, and it'd be great for you to be able to share that with us. Great question. And it's funny, how did I get interested in lifestyle medicine? So I can tell you when I started at the Mass General Cancer Center, gosh, I want to say 2011, I think somewhere around that time, I saw a flyer that Harvard Medical School was offering this course on lifestyle medicine. And I was like, what is lifestyle medicine? And I looked at the agenda and it was, the topics were all of great interest to me. I'm a runner. I've always been really passionate about exercise and nutrition and mind-body interventions and all of that. And so I was like, wow, I should go to this conference because I would love to learn more about the evidence behind all of these um, types of lifestyle behaviors and how they may help my cancer patients. Because, you know, when our patients go through treatment, certainly, you know, it really knocks people down. It's cancer treatment. It's no joke. I think everyone knows that. And, you know, exercise, nutrition, sleep, stress management, social connection, avoiding substance abuse, all of these pillars of lifestyle medicine, which I now am quite familiar with, play such an important role in helping my patient population in terms of optimizing health, well-being, and outcome from cancer. There's actually really interesting data now showing the benefits of physical activity, for example, in terms of lowering risk of breast cancer recurrence. So that's really important. And every breast cancer survivor really needs to know about that data and why exercise is so important. So actually, given this interest, I've been fortunate to collaborate with a colleague here in Boston, Dr. Beth Frades, who is a leader in the field of lifestyle medicine. And in collaboration with her, I've developed this program for women with breast cancer to really help educate them on all of these topics in lifestyle medicine and also help empower them to make these lifestyle changes to help improve and optimize their health. 
And that's been really fun for me. It's certainly a passion of mine, and I can't wait to grow the program further over time. Can you tell us the name of this program? Does it have a name yet? Yes. And um, well, Dr. Frady's gets the credit for the name because she's amazing. <laughs> Giving a shout out to her. It's called Paving the Path to Wellness. Um, and certainly that's what we call it. And she originated the program focused on helping stroke survivors, which is amazing. And so I've been developing it for women with breast cancer in collaboration with her and another wonderful colleague, who you may know, Dr. Michelle Tolison. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's been a really fun collaboration and it's just really wonderful to help so many women you know, after they've gone through the intense treatment for breast cancer and helping them make these lifestyle changes, which are so important. This program sounds amazing. I can't wait to hear more about it as it develops. So we, we may have, we, I'm sure that we do have a lot of listeners that, you know, don't have cancer, but like all of us, they're worried that they're going to get cancer because it is so common. So can you talk about these principles? that you're implementing for your individuals, your patients who are already diagnosed with cancer, but we can do a lot, right? That to, to help prevent cancer through these principles as well. Yeah. Absolutely. There's so much data now showing that our lifestyle behaviors play a key role in helping reduce risk for development of cancer. Certainly not just breast cancer, but many different kinds of cancer. Um, just to think of one obvious example, which is kind of an unfortunate one in the United States right now, but obesity is, you know, certainly smoking is way up there as like the leading cause of cancer, but in terms of modifiable risk factors. But now obesity is getting really close and studies predict that obesity is going to be the number one, you know, modifiable risk factor in terms of a cause for cancer, probably in the next 10 to 15 years. And I think you know, that's really unfortunate that our country is facing this problem, obviously not just our country, the entire world, but that's really kind of a wake up call that we really do need to, as a society, focus on lifestyle factors to help, you know, address that problem. Obesity is one major risk factor, of course, smoking and alcohol intake is way up there too. And I think there's, since it is breast cancer awareness month, I do just want to state that alcohol is clearly a risk factor for breast cancer. And women, you know, the ideal situation would be to not drink at all, but certainly if one chooses to drink, really limiting it to one drink per day is really what we would recommend. Okay. Yeah. So that's, you know, we do have an obesity issue for sure in this country, more than other countries. Um, you know, there's lots of factors that you know, I've read about, I've read in the literature, I mean, it's the types of foods we're eating, it's the stresses we're under, it's the lack of education, it's the lack of healthy foods being available, lots of factors. Um, what do you think, what do you see as, you know, the major causes, those causes, other causes, you know, what can we tell our listeners in terms of, you know, what they can do to either prevent obesity or to start decreasing their weight if they are obese. You know, no shaming here. Just let's make today a brand new day. And how can we move forward from today if we need to work on losing that weight to decrease the incidence of cancer? Robin, that's such a great question. I wish it was an easy answer, but as you earlier in this podcast, we were discussing what are the pillars of lifestyle medicine. And I really think focusing on each of those pillars will help us as a society be healthier. And just to review those for our listeners, you know, number one, sleep, getting adequate sleep, of which I am guilty sometimes, but getting adequate sleep is really key and increasing evidence is showing how our sleep habits oft also influence our body weight and, you know, regulation of that and stress, et cetera. So sleep, sleep, sleep is so important. Um, number two, certainly our diet is important. And Increasing evidence really shows the benefit of following a plant predominant diet. That's what I'm the term I'm going to use. Certainly, if, if individuals like to eat chicken and fish, limit the red meat, that's okay. But a plant predominant diet is really the healthiest diet. So that's what I recommend to my patients as well. Stress management, and that's your area of expertise, but certainly we know that that is so key also for regulation of body weight, avoiding alcohol and other risky substances, alcohol has a, has a lot of calories, you know, so if you have two glasses of wine, 
that's at least 300, 350 calories right there, empty calories. So that's an important thing for our listeners to recognize. Physical activity, we can't forget that one because exercise is certainly so key and so important. And finally, social connection. Our environment, who we spend time with, also has been shown to influence our own body weight. So if you're around people who want to eat pizza and drink Coca-Cola all day, that's what you're going to do too. So it's really great to kind of help inculcate these healthy habits in your family members and friends as well. That is such amazing advice. Yeah, we don't really think necessarily so much about the people around us influencing our behaviors, but it's so true. It's so true. And it's also a point to educate others, you know, hey, we don't need to be eating that. We don't need to be drinking that, (laughs) right? Yeah, that's awesome. So let's talk a little bit about mammograms, right? So you and I were chatting a little bit earlier before we started the podcast about mammograms, and there has been a decreased instance in individuals during the pandemic, which we're filming right now, right? We're, we're recording right now during the COVID pandemic, and there has been a decreased instance in individuals going and getting their mammograms for many reasons. Let's talk about that. Let's talk about the importance of that. Bringing up this important topic, given that we're recording this in October, Um, So unfortunately, as we all know, during, I guess, in the spring of 2020, at that time, you know, the CDC and other organizations really recommended that we halt all non-essential medical tests because of the COVID-19 pandemic and all the concerns associated with that. So during that time frame from March through the end of May 2020, there was a 94% drop in routine mammographic screenings. So all of those women, all those hundreds of thousands of women who would have gotten their mammogram did not. And since that time now, obviously our hospitals are open again for business, but there are many factors which unfortunately are still you know, limiting access for women to get their mammograms. And many patients are, many of our patients are also, you know, fearful of coming to the hospital or can't get time off to go, you know, to get a mammogram because of childcare issues or many other factors. So we really do need to focus on how can we help make mammographic screening more accessible and feel safer um, for those who are maybe fearful of going to the hospital. So this is a major initiative being taken on now by the American Cancer Society and other organizations to encourage women to get back to screening not just for breast cancer, of course, but we're also talking about colonoscopy screening, cervical cancer screening, et cetera. Yeah, and as we were talking about earlier, you know, it's a part of self-care, right? Taking care of yourself, that's part of self-care. It's something you can do for yourself to catch something early, right? We, you don't wanna come in at a time when things are far advanced. You wanna take care of it early and self-care isn't selfish. Right. (laughs) I say that all the time, whether it be taking care of your stress levels, whether it be eating properly, sleeping, but getting your mammogram, getting your colonoscopy, getting your pap smear, if it's the right time for your schedule to do that, those are those are self-care things that you can do for yourself, procedures you can do for yourself that you can enhance your life and and increase your longevity and improve, you know, your outcomes by catching things early. So I just wanted to, you know, bring that up because there are a lot of people out there. And we also talked about how we as doctors sometimes are (laughs) right there with people. Oh, I don't, I'm too busy. I don't have time. I'll do it next time. And then just time goes by and time goes by. So, you know, get your mammogram. It's Breast Cancer Awareness Month. Make sure you get your colonoscopy. (laughs) Make sure you get your pap smears. Take care of you. Yeah. And that reminds me so beautifully stated that reminds me of a sign in our breast imaging department and it states for after a woman gets her mammogram there's a big sign that says thank you for taking care of you today and I think that's a really important message you know you and I Robin are both super busy physicians and just the fact that you know it is important to take time to take care of yourself and whether that means getting a mammogram you know or getting massage, but you certainly get the mammogram because, you know, yeah. that is so important to prioritize these kind of preventative screenings, which we know um, studies, many studies show that mammograms save lives. And that's why it's so important to prioritize this. 
Yeah, and not to exclude any of the males in our listening audience, but we want you to get your PSA levels checked for prostate. You know, we want you to go and get your exams and get your levels checked as well. So whatever preventative measures your doctor recommends, we're just encouraging that to be self-care all the way around. Definitely agree for sure. Yeah. Okay. Any routine screenings are down, not just breast cancer screening. All the things you just alluded to, so important. All the things, yeah. So what would you like to leave our audience with? Just one final pearl. What would you like them to hear from you? That's such a great question. And so I think given you know that it is October and Breast Cancer Awareness Month, I love one of the lines you just stated, um, self-care is not selfish. And I am directing this to the women who are listening to your podcast today, but please take care of yourself. Take that time, not only to get your mammogram, to try out that yoga class or what other, you know, stress management types of approaches that you've learned from Robin, but take time to exercise, take time to focus on eating your fruits and vegetables try to limit the alcohol, try to get enough sleep at night. You know, all the factors in lifestyle medicine that we've just discussed are so important for our optimal health. And we are all a work in progress. We are all paving that path to wellness. And I think we just have to recognize that and take it one day at a time. Thank you for that. Thank you so much. So Dr. Commander, we may have a lot of people that are saying, hey, like, where is she? How can I reach her? How can I find her if I have a question, if I want to get a consult, um, if I want to know more about this program that she's talking about that's not quite out yet? What is the best way for individuals to reach out to you, whether they be healthcare professionals or patients? Great question. So I'm here in Boston. So for those of you in the in New England, that's where I am. But um, I do have a profile on Twitter on Dr. Amy Commander. By the way, Commander has one M. Many people like to add an extra M. There's only one. <laughs> <laughs> and I do have an Instagram account. So, you know, I certainly get many messages from individuals, whether it's through Twitter or Instagram, and that's a great way to reach me as well. And Instagram is also the handle Dr. Amy Commander with one yeah. M. Okay. Oh. All right. Yeah. So I will put all of that in the notes, in the show notes. And, um, what about this program you're talking about? Will that be something you'll be putting out on your social media or where yeah. will they find that? The Path to Wellness is currently um, being offered to um, breast cancer survivors at the Mass General Cancer Center, but it is a goal someday to broaden the program to reach more women. And so I would say that is a work in progress, but hopefully we'll have more to come on that soon. Okay, so stay tuned, everybody. <laughs> stay tuned for that program. I'll definitely be looking out for that. Okay, so I want to thank everyone, everyone listening. Thank you so much for listening and for taking time to care for amazing you. Remember to be kind to one another. Remember to be kind to yourself. And I look forward to connecting with you on the next episode of the Stress-Free MD Podcast.